some problems, help them, and grow the economy. I know there are many Democrats and Republicans here today who want to be able to say the same to their constituents. And I hope they will stand with me and with Senator Collins and vote against a filibuster of our bipartisan bill. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor. Senator from Louisiana. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I stand today to discuss and strongly support my bill S-101, the State and Local Government Bailout Prevention Act. And I would urge all of us tonight to pass this bill expeditiously. Let me briefly explain what it's about. I first introduced this bill, Mr. President, in early 2011, February 2011, because two things were happening. First of all, several significant state and local entities were teetering on the verge of bankruptcy. And, Mr. President, at the same time, the federal government uh, things in Washington were in a horrible state fiscally, such that we could clearly not afford to take on more spending, more debt, more responsibility. So I wanted to pass legislation that would make it crystal clear. We, the Congress, nor the Treasury Department, nor the Federal Reserve, nor any other federal entity, were going to bail out state or local governments which had acted irresponsibly and tipped into bankruptcy. Now, Mr. President, things have not gotten better since then. In fact, things in many ways have gotten worse. And very recently, just in the last few weeks, Detroit, the city of Detroit, filed for bankruptcy, the largest municipal bankruptcy in U.S. history. Other large states and local communities are teetering on the verge of bankruptcy. Many states in horrible fiscal situations like California and Illinois. Meanwhile, Mr. President, we are not in a fundamentally sounder place here in Washington at the federal level. Even if we stick to the Budget Control Act numbers, and that's very much up in the air, but even if we stick to those numbers, Congress will spend $967 billion in discretionary money this year, and that will result in an $810 billion deficit, almost a trillion dollar deficit this year. This nation total is almost $17 trillion in debt, and the Federal Reserve, its balance sheet has swollen from $800 billion in August of 2007 to over $3.5 trillion today. And so, Mr. President, now more than ever, S-101, the State and Local Government Bailout Prevention Act, is appropriate, is needed. And that's why I come to the floor today to urge expeditious passage of S-101. This bill is very simple, basic, straightforward, but important. It would basically do four things. First, it would prohibit the use of federal funds to bail out state and local government budgets. Secondly, it would prevent the Federal Reserve from providing assistance to or creating a facility to help, again, state and local government in a bailout situation. Third, it would prevent Congress and the Treasury Department from bailing out state and local governments. And fourth, there is specific language so we don't create any confusion that this is not intended to stop or deter or interfere with appropriate assistance in declared disaster areas. That's the sum and substance of it. S-101, the State and, and Local Government Bailout Prevention Act. Again, Mr. President, when you look at situations like Detroit, the largest ever municipal bankruptcy, and when you look at our fiscal situation in Washington at the federal level, this clear statement, this clear bar of the feds bailing out state and local government is very, very much needed. And so I ask unanimous consent that the Committee on Banking, Housing, and Urban Development be discharged from further consideration of S-101 and the Senate proceed to its immediate consideration and that the bill be read a third time and passed, the motion to reconsider be considered and laid 
be, be considered made and laid upon the table. Is there an objection? Mr. President, I object. <clears throat> the objection is heard. Mr. President, I'm going to be very, very brief. First, let me say to my colleague from Louisiana, he and I have worked together often on a whole host of issues. He's on environment and public works. I chair energy. I want him to know that I'm happy to keep working with him on this and, uh, and other uh, issues. The reason I have to object at this time, uh, Mr. President, is the language as it's written would deal a huge body blow to more than 700 rural and heavily forested counties across the country in more than 40 of our states. It, in effect, could prohibit payments under the Secure Rural Schools and Community Self-Determination Act. This legislation, which was a bipartisan bill, Senator Larry Craig and myself you know, author, authorized uh, uh, this legislation, is a lifeline for these hard-hit rural communities that are walking on a tightrope, Mr. President, trying to balance, for example, how they're going to keep the schools open and how they're going to have law enforcement in their uh, communities. And declining revenues from federal forests spurred the creation of this program to compensate for the loss of receipts from the federal uh, forests. And suffice it to say, without this legislation, we could have school perhaps three days a week in a big chunk of rural uh, America. And I mentioned, you know, law enforcement. Uh, question of how you maintain 24-hour law enforcement in a lot of these uh, areas has been drawn into question, and I think without uh, this assistance, we might have some counties facing, you know, bankruptcy. And given the fact that this uh, language does not, you know, clarify the uh, status of the Secure Rural Schools, you know, program, I have to uh, object, and I'm going to continue to object until the legislation does clarify that it will not prohibit payments under that legislation, which is a lifeline, colleagues, for rural America. We've had a number of recorded votes on that particular legislation here in the Senate. It has received overwhelming bipartisan support. It was authorized on a bipartisan basis. Mr. President, I'm going to yield uh, the floor. I know colleagues want to speak uh, on this. I just want to understood how concerned I am about the legislation in its uh, present form, and that is why I have to object this time. Mr. President, I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Michigan. Mr. President, I, uh, too, uh, join with uh, our colleague from Oregon and, uh, in great, raising great concern about uh, what this proposal would do. Uh, this is a proposal, we've seen actually three of them now, that would cut all federal funding for any community that has either defaulted or, more importantly, is at risk, has problems financially. Uh, so what does that mean? It means that any city, any county, any local unit of government that's struggling with a tight budget could potentially lose all federal funding. I mean, we're not talking about a bailout here. We're talking about the same federal funds that go to every community. No funding for emergency services like police departments and fire departments. No funding for transportation, for roads and bridges. Cutting off funding for special education and for our schools. No funding for economic development to help these communities who are challenged because of possibly economic circumstances, a shifting manufacturing base, or other economic issues beyond their control. So this is extremely broad. According to some legal definitions, default could mean anything late payments on any kind of an obligation, and it makes absolutely no sense. Uh, and let me also indicate that uh, one of the real concerning problems here is that it would exempt uh, emergency spending for a natural disaster. I appreciate that the senator from Louisiana would want to do that, given the fact that we had Hurricane Katrina hit in New Orleans and our whole country came together. People in Detroit raised money to help with Hurricane Katrina. But I would suggest for the 41 cities and counties who've filed bankruptcy over the last 20 years or the hundreds from Texas to Kentucky to Alabama uh, to and beyond who now have troubled bond ratings and are considered at risk, this is really a slap in the face to uh, every city and community across our country. Uh, so, uh, 
uh, I would strongly suggest uh, this is not about stopping a bailout for Detroit. You know, we're working hard. People are coming together. Uh, this is a community that's coming back because of a tremendous amount of grit and hard work and leadership from the business community, religious community, uh, community leaders, and so on. This is about whether or not we're going to support uh, communities that need some help and if it, just think about this if you're a city that is doing well and you have a wealthy tax base and you're an upper middle income community with high powered lobbyists then you should get federal money taxpayer money your if your children with disabilities can get special education we're going to help build roads and bridges in your community but if you're having some financial difficulty then unfortunately we would say that we would not allow the same ordinary federal funding that every community gets to be available for you. This is not the right values, Mr. President, for America. This is why the International City County Management Association strongly opposes this. The National Association of Counties, the National League of Cities, the U.S. Conference of Mayors, the Government Finance Officers Association strongly oppose this effort. And I would make one final statement before turning to um, our distinguished uh, senior senator from Michigan. I want to also say that when we are looking at what's happening right now in Detroit and around the country, once again we are seeing workers and retirees on the front line to lose pensions and to lose their wages. Uh, you know, in the auto rescue we saw Delphi retirees' pensions were not protected now in the city of Detroit. Police and fire and city workers aren't protected. So when we talk about the middle class of this country, people working hard every day, we need to put them first. We mean, need to make sure nobody loses their pension, and we need to make sure that we stand as a country with cities that are in distress, uh, that are working hard to become vibrant and strong again. I would yield the floor, Mr. President. Senator from Michigan. I, too, object to the unanimous consent request. Uh, I, I also object to the unanimous consent request that while the sponsor says that it is aimed at bailouts, uh, no one is seeking a bailout that I know of from the communities that would be impacted. And despite the stated intention, the effect of this bill is, uh, is to endanger the financial health of hundreds of cities and counties in every corner of this county, of this country. It would weaken the safety and the security of countless Americans who call those communities home. I don't know of anyone seeking a bailout, but yet bailouts is the word that is used frequently here by the sponsor of this legislation. The definition, what is the definition? Communities at risk of defaulting. Hundreds and hundreds of communities are, quote, at risk of defaulting. It's unclear what that means, but the strains on local governments in the last few years particularly uh, following uh, the financial crisis that we have are real and to say that any community, city, state for that matter that is at risk of defaulting then uh, is uh, to be challenged in terms of getting regular support from the federal government. This is not limited to loans. This bill affects grants as well as loans. In the words of the bill, grants and aid would be prevented. All sorts of federal funding, in other words, beside those kind of uh, actions of the federal government involved, involving credit or reliance on credit of the donor for repayment. Now, the Congressional Research Service uh, says that this, again, applies not just to loans but to grants as well. Why, in heaven's name, struggling communities, whether it's my hometown of Detroit, or any other community in this country would be denied the, the ability to seek grants, not loans, because it's not limited to loans, but grants is beyond me. This bill goes way beyond the bailouts that no one is seeking, and it would have a severe impact on cities and towns across the country. Standard & Poor's lists more than 250 securities offered by Louisiana municipalities that are below investment grade. That's just one state. That's 250 communities in one state whose securities are below investment grade, presumably meaning there's a significant credit risk in those communities. 
Are those communities then, under this bill, not going to be eligible to seek regular grants? I'm afraid so, and that's not just me saying. That, again, is the CRS. Finally, uh, Senator Stabenow has made reference to a letter that we've received from the National League of Cities, National Association of Counties, United States Conference of Mayors and others uh, opposing this legislation because it goes way beyond its stated purpose of uh, preventing uh, bailouts. Again, my town, and I don't know of any town, but my town hasn't asked for a bailout. I'm proud to have been living in Detroit all my life. It doesn't need this kind of legislation poking at it to stop something from going to Detroit, which it hasn't applied for. And so I know this legislation was introduced before this recent bankruptcy, of the part of the bankruptcy application on the part of the city of Detroit, but nonetheless, in this context, in this moment, to be seeking unanimous consent to pass legislation, apparently without even a hearing, it seems to me beyond the pale. And so I oppose these I oppose this proposal as a lifelong resident of Detroit, but way beyond. Uh, I oppose it because thousands of municipalities that have suffered in the aftermath of the recent recession would be negatively affected. Our residents, their residents, our employees, their employees, and retirees around the country deserve better. I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Louisiana. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I appreciate the two senators from Michigan being the only ones on the floor right now objecting, saying this has nothing to do with Detroit. But of course it does, Mr. President. I'm very sorry to hear this objection. There is no objection on the Republican side. Of course there would be if, in fact, this legislation would bar normal federal grants, normal federal loans unrelated to a bailout of a state or a municipality in bankruptcy mode. But it doesn't do that. The legislation is very specific. It's very targeted. It's about a bailout of a state or locality in bankruptcy mode. That's what it's about. It's not about normal, routine federal funding. Uh, that's why there is no Republican objection. Now, one of the distinguished senators from Michigan makes the point that Detroit has not formally asked for a bailout. That's true so far, but when the mayor uh, talked to the Wall Street Journal about this, he, quote, left the door open for a federal bailout after the city's bankruptcy filing. When asked directly whether Detroit would seek a federal bailout, Mayor Bing said, quote, not yet, close quote. Similarly, the governor of Michigan, Rick Snyder, didn't support a bailout, but he said on CBS's Face the Nation, quote, if the federal government wants to do that, that's their option, close quote. That's not exactly not opening the door and considering that opportunity. Again, Mr. President, I didn't file this bill in the last two weeks. I originally filed this bill in February of 2011. And it's because Detroit isn't, unfortunately, the only municipal or state bankruptcy on the map. States can formally file bankruptcy, but they can essentially go bankrupt in layman's terms. And Detroit isn't the only uh, issue on the map. Many states face a horrible fiscal situation as well, like California and Illinois. And there is very much the real danger of these states and localities seeking a federal bailout. This bill is about that. It's not about normal federal funding. It's not about the uh, safe and secure rural schools program. It's not about any of that routine stuff. It's about a bailout of a state. It's about a bailout of a municipality or other local jurisdiction. And of course, Detroit, unfortunately, is the most obvious example after its historic bankruptcy filing very recently. So again, Mr. President, I'm sorry to hear objection. I'm sorry the two senators from Michigan are here on the floor about this. I don't think that's a coincidence because this is a bill about bailouts and I do think we should pass it, be very crystal clear at the federal level that we're not going to take on that bailout role and responsibility. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor. Mr. President, 
Senator from Michigan. Mr. President, I would ask unanimous consent to insert in the record again the language of Senator Vitter's bill. And that no language objection. says on line 7 of page 1 that notwithstanding any other provision of law, and then after talking about federal funds not being used to purchase or guarantee obligations, it then says, or no federal funds may be used, or to provide direct or indirect grants and aid to any state government, municipal government, local government, or county government, which after January 26, 2011, has defaulted on its obligations. So what it says, it's very clear, it's line 7, page 1, and lines 1 and 2, page 2, direct or indirect grants and aid may not be provided to any city which has defaulted on its obligations. So this is, this is the language of the bill. Now it also says that on line 12 of page 2, that the United States funds may not be used to assist any such government entity. Assist any such government entity. Hundreds of governments would be covered by this legislation. And yeah, it is no coincidence that the senators from Michigan are here on the floor because we are the most current victim of this language if it were ever passed. There are other hundreds of others who would be victimized by this language because of its breadth, and that's what the senator from Oregon was very dramatically pointing out. And I ask that unanimous consent that the language that I referred to, this bill language, be inserted in the record at this time. Without objection. Uh, Mr. President. Senator from Iowa. Uh, I, support the nom I support the nomination of Raymond T. Chen to be a United States Circuit Judge for the Federal Circuit. This is the 29th judicial confirmation this year. With today's confirmation, the Senate will have confirmed 200 lower court nominees. We've defeated two. That would be a 200 approval versus two disapproval. A 99% rate, I think uh, we've had a pretty outstanding record this Congress. Uh, and also doing it at a fast pace. Uh, during the last Congress, we confirmed more judges than any Congress since the 103rd Congress, and that goes way back 20 years. So far this year, the first of President Obama's second term, we've already confirmed more judges than were confirmed in the entire first year of President Bush's second term. At a similar stage in President Bush's second term, only 10 judicial nominees have been confirmed. So we're now at a 29 to 10 comparison with President Obama's uh, clearly, uh, being clearly ahead of where President Bush was at a similar time frame. As I have said, uh, we've already confirmed more nominees, 29 this year, than we did during the entire entirety of 2005, the first year of President Bush's second term, uh, when 21 lower court judges were confirmed. With regard to the hearings, the record shows that President Obama uh, is uh, being well received here in the Senate, uh, much better than President Bush during his second term. Last week, we held the 11th judicial nominations hearing this year. In those hearings, we will have considered a total of 33 judicial nominees. Compare this favorable treatment of uh, President Obama during the beginning of the second term versus the first year of President Bush's second term. At this stage in President Bush's second term, the committee had not held 11 hearings with, judi with 33 judicial nominees, but only three hearings for five nominees, and all of those were holdovers from the previous Congress. Uh, in fact, for the entire year of 2005, Senate allowed seven hearings for a grand total of 18 judicial nominees. It is hard to believe, but no nomination hearings on judicial nominees were held during April, May, June, or July, four months with no judicial hearings. Yet we recently raced through hearings on nominees 
to the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, plus a number of district nominations. In fact, in the last few weeks, we have held hearings for 14 judicial nominees. That's not very far behind the entire output of the year 2005, seven hearings and 18 nominees. Again, we have already exceeded that number, 11 hearings and 33 uh, nominees. The bottom line is that the Senate is processing the president nominees exceptionally fairly, uh, and that's the best way to get the job done. President Obama certainly is being treated more fairly than the first year of his second term than Senate Democrats treated President Bush in 2005. It's not clear to me how allowing more votes and more hearings than President Bush got in an entire year amounts to, quote, unprecedented delays and All time for debate has expired. End of quote. Um, I'm, I ask people to vote for this nomination. Madam President, I ask uh, consent for 30 seconds. W without objection, the senator from Vermont. I believe we should act quickly to reduce the number of judicial vacancies. 11 of the 12 circuit district nominees currently paying for the Senate reported by voice vote, all Democrats, all Republicans on the Judiciary Committee uh, voting together. You know, there's no reason why we couldn't consider all 12 today along with uh, Mr. Chan. If we work together, then we can fulfill the needs of the federal judiciary. Have the A's and A's been ordered? They have not. I would press the A's and A's. Is there a sufficient second? There appears to be. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander, Ms. Ayotte, Ms. Baldwin, Mr. Barrasso, Mr. Baucus, Mr. Begich, Mr. Bennett, Mr. Blumenthal, Mr. Blunt, Mr. Bozeman, Mrs. Boxer, Mr. Brown, Mr. Burr, Ms. Cantwell. Mr. Cardin. Mr. Carper. Mr. Casey. Mr. Chambliss. Mr. Chiesa. Mr. Coates, Mr. Coburn, Mr. Cochran, Ms. Collins, Mr. Coons, Mr. Corker, Mr. Cornyn, Mr. Crapo, Mr. Cruz, Mr. Donnelly. Mr. Durbin. Mr. Enzi. Mrs. Feinstein. Mrs. Fisher. Mr. Flake. Mr. Franken. Mrs. Gillibrand, Mr. Graham, Mr. Grassley, Mrs. Hagen, Mr. Harkin, Mr. Hatch, Mr. Heinrich, Ms. Heitkamp. Mr. Heller. That's easy because we don't know where to refer to Ms. Hirono. Yeah, you know. Mr. Hoven. Mr. Inhoff. Mr. Isaacson. Mr. Johans. 
Mr. Johnson of Wisconsin. Mr. Johnson of South Dakota. Mr. Kane. Mr. King. Mr. Kirk. Ms. Klobuchar. Ms. Landrew. Mr. Leahy. Mr. Lee. Mr. Levin. Mr. Manchin. Mr. Markey. Mr. McCain. Mrs. McCaskill. Mr. McConnell. Mr. Menendez. Mr. Merkley. Ms. Mikulski. Mr. Moran, Ms. Murkowski, Mr. Murphy, Mrs. Murray, Mr. Nelson, Mr. Paul, Mr. Portman, Mr. Pryor, Mr. Reed of Rhode Island, Mr. Reed of Nevada, Mr. Risch, Mr. Roberts, Mr. Rockefeller, Mr. Rubio, Mr. Sanders, Mr. Schatz, Mr. Schumer, Mr. Scott. Mrs. Shaheen, Mr. Shelby, Ms. Dabnow, Mr. Tester, Mr. Thune, Mr. Toomey, Mr. Udall of Colorado, Mr. Udall of New Mexico, Mr. Vitter, Mr. Warner, Ms. Warren, Mr. Whitehouse, Mr. Wicker, Mr. Wyden, Senators voting in the affirmative. Baldwin, Bennett, Blumenthal, Block Boxer, Cantwell, Chiesa, Coburn, Coons, Cornyn, Cruz, Franken, Grassley, Hagen, King, Leahy, Levin, Manchin, Markey, Murray, Rockefeller, Schatz, Tester, Udall of New Mexico, Warren, White House, and Wyden. No senator voted in the negative. Mr. Durbin. Mr. Durbin, aye. Mr. Carper. Mr. Carper, aye. Mrs. Fisher. Mrs. Fisher, aye. Mr. Pryor. Mr. Pryor, aye. Mr. Reed. Mr. Reed of Rhode Island, aye.
Mr. McConnell. Mr. McConnell, aye. Mr. Begich, Mr. Begich, aye. Ms. Collins, Ms. Collins, aye. Mr. Sanders, Mr. Sanders, aye. Mr. Murphy, Mr. Murphy, aye. Mr. Shelby, Mr. Shelby, aye. Mrs. Gillibrand, Mrs. Gillibrand, aye. Mr. Warner, Mr. Warner, aye. Mr. Isaacson, Mr. Isaacson, aye. Ms. Stabenow, Ms. Stabenow, aye. Mr. Roberts, Mr. Roberts, aye. Mrs. Shaheen, Mrs. Shaheen, aye. Mr. Moran, Mr. Moran, aye. Mr. Lee, Mr. Lee, aye. Ms. Mikulski, Ms. Mikulski, aye. Mr. Donnelly, Mr. Donnelly. Ms. Ayotte, Ms. Ayotte, aye. Mr. Johnson, Mr. Johnson of Wisconsin, aye. Ms. Hirono, Ms. Hirono, aye. Ms. Murkowski, Ms. Murkowski, aye. Mr. Schumer, Mr. Schumer, 
Kirk. Mr. Kirk, aye. Mr. Nelson, Mr. Nelson, aye. Mr. Bozeman, Mr. Bozeman, aye. Mr. Burr, Mr. Burr, aye. Mr. Toomey, Mr. Toomey, aye. Mr. Kane, Mr. Kane, aye. Mrs. McCaskill, Mrs. McCaskill, aye. Mr. Hoven, Mr. Hoven, aye. Mr. Johans, Mr. Johans, Aye. Mr. Cardin. Mr. Cardin. Aye. Mr. Rubio. Mr. Rubio. Aye. Mr. Sessions. Mr. Sessions. Aye. Ms. Heitkamp. Ms. Heitkamp. Aye. Mr. Cochran, Mr. Cochran, aye. Mr. Soon, Mr. Soon, aye. Mr. Casey, Mr. Casey, aye. Mr. Paul, Mr. Paul, aye. Mr. Merkley, Mr. Merkley, aye. Mr. Johnson, Mr. Johnson of South Dakota, aye. Mr. Baucus, Mr. Baucus, aye. Mr. Harkin, Mr. Harkin, aye. Mr. Udall, Mr. Udall of Colorado, aye. Mr. Vitter, Mr. Vitter, aye. Mr. Wicker, Mr. Wicker, aye. Mr. Menendez, Mr. Menendez, aye. Mr. Brown, Mr. Brown, aye. Mr. Scott, Mr. Scott, aye. 
Mr. Brasso, Mr. Brasso, aye. Mr. Enzi, Mr. Enzi, aye. Mr. Heller, Mr. Heller, aye. Mr. I Mr. Alexander, Mr. Alexander, aye. Mr. Reed, Mr. Reed of Nevada, aye. Mr. Rich, Mr. Rich, aye. Mr. Heinrich, Mr. Heinrich, aye. Mr. Coates, Mr. Coates, aye. Mr. Graham, Mr. Graham, aye. Mr. Flake, Mr. Flake, aye. Mr. Corker, Mr. Corker, aye. Ms. Klobuchar, Ms. Klobuchar, aye. Mr. Hatch, Mr. Hatch, aye. Mr. Portman, Mr. Portman, aye. Mr. Chambliss, Mr. Chambliss, aye. Mrs. Feinstein, Mrs. Feinstein, aye. Mr. Crapo, Mr. Crapo,
Mr. Blunt, Mr. Blunt, aye. Has every senator in the chamber voted? Does any senator in the chamber wish to change his or her vote? If not, the yeas are 97, the nays are zero, and the nomination is confirmed. Under the previous order, the motion to reconsider is considered made and laid upon the table. The president will be immediately notified of the Senate's action, and the Senate will resume legislative session. Under the previous order, there will be 10 minutes for debate only, with the senator from Maine, Ms. Collins, controlling eight minutes, and with two minutes equally divided in Madam the president, usual the form is not prior to a vote on the Madam motion president. to invoke cloture on S-1243. Madam President, the Senate is not in order. The, the Senate is not in order. The Senate will be in order. Madam President, Madam President, have the majority leader sit down and shut up, okay? It's unfair. The Senate will Senator be in Murray order. Has something to say. Senator Collins has something. It's just not polite. The Senate will be in order. Senators will take their conversations from the well. Senate will be in order. Madam President. The Senator from Maine. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, the Senate will shortly decide whether or not to invoke cloture on the fiscal year 2014 Transportation, Housing, and Urban Development Appropriations Bill. We have spent nearly two weeks debating this bill and working through approximately 85 amendments. We were making progress. We even had a vote on a non-germane amendment, which clearly would have fallen to a point of order had one been raised. So no one has been shut out of this process. Chairman Murray and I have repeatedly encouraged senators to come to the floor, file and debate their amendments to improve the bill that we reported. It has been an open and transparent debate thus far, a return to regular order, something that I have heard virtually everyone here urge us to do. Nevertheless, some senators are intent on preventing this legislation from moving forward, despite the fact that this bill is not the final version of the Transportation and Housing Appropriations Bill. It is only one step in the process, but an essential step, one that will allow the Senate to move forward and eventually negotiate with the House of Representatives to decide on a top line and to further improve the bill. Now, a considerable number of my colleagues have advocated for the House funding level of $44 billion and have opposed the Senate bill. But I would like to point out that not one of my colleagues has offered a specific amendment, account by account, to reduce the funding levels, program by program, in this bill to meet the $44 billion level in the House bill. I personally offered an amendment that said that in October, if we find that we have breached the top line of the Budget Control Act, that we would go back to the appropriations process and redo the bills to meet that top line. And I would also point out that just yesterday, the House leadership was forced to pull its T-HUD bill from the floor due to lack of support. Now, some Republican members thought that the spending levels were too high, but it's surely significant that a 
A substantial number of Republicans felt that the bill as written was far too low and would hurt our homeless vet, vet, veterans, would delay repair of our crumbling infrastructure, and would slash the Community Development Block Grant Program to the lowest level in history, to below the 1975 level when it was first created by President Ford. So let me point out that the numbers in the House bill were not realistic, and that is one of the reasons that it failed. The numbers in our bill are not unrealistic. They are too high. They would come down in conference. The President's request was artificially low due to several budget gimmicks and scoring differences. We took care of those gimmicks. We have an honest bill that is before our members. Let me give you just one example of a gimmick that was in the President's budget. His request for the Section 8 project-based rental assistance is insufficient to fully fund the 12-month renewal contracts with private owners. Well, we're not going to be throwing people out of these subsidized apartments after 10 months in the year. So Senator Murray and I added funding to more accurately reflect what was needed. That was over a billion dollars of difference. There was a difference in the scoring by CBO and OMB, and we have to go by CBO. That accounted for $1.8 billion. Now, it is disappointing to me, Madam President, that we have not gone to conference on the budget because we would not be in this dilemma. We would have agreed upon allocations that would guide the appropriations process. But in the absence of that, what is wrong with proceeding with this bill, with cutting spending in it, if members have, have amendments that they wish to offer to cut spending, and there are a few that have been offered, but as, as I said, none that bring it down to the House's level in an account-by-account -account manner. I'm still hopeful that we will be able to pass this bill and start bringing other appropriations bills to the floor before the end of the fiscal year, because forcing the government to operate under continuing resolutions is irresponsible. It ends up costing more money in the long run, and it's wasteful because we continue to fund programs that are no longer needed because we're just continuing current law. So I urge my colleagues to think very carefully about this vote. It would be so unfortunate if we go home to our constituents in August and are forced to tell them that we're unable to do our job. We should pass, we should continue working on this bill, we should invoke cloture. This bill undoubtedly would have been reduced in conference had we been allowed to move forward. I do want to thank many of my colleagues for working with us as we tried so hard to advance this important legislation. I'm particularly grateful to Chairman Murray for her bipartisan approach and collaboration and for working so closely with me throughout the process. And finally, I would be remiss if I did not thank our staffs on both sides of the aisle for their hard work. They have worked night and day on this bill. I will put all of their names in the record. I know my time is expiring, but Madam President, let's do the right thing. Let's proceed to end the debate on this bill, take care of the rest of the germane amendments, and proceed to final passage and ultimately to conference with the House. Let's show 
that we mean it when we say that we're committed to full and open debate and returning to the process that used to serve us well. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President.